Welcome to Siamu Series, a podcast about mental health. We will touch on popular topics and insights from professionals from Siamud. Hi everyone, I'm Sally, and this is Siamud's podcast. I want to go back to one of our past live webinars called LGBTQ2S Plus and Mental Health. Each year in June, people join and celebrate Pride Month a lovely time to shine awareness to our 2S LGBTQ plus family. And what better way to highlight this month with this webinar? I hope you enjoy this. Hello everyone and welcome to another SciMood webinar event. My name is Ross Wilson. I am so honored and thankful and grateful for all of you to be here today this evening as we're talking about the LGBTQ plus community and mental health. Some of you may have seen me before, either on our webinars or on the podcast that we have on iTunes and Spotify, which is SciMood Series Podcast. Um, I am a mental health consultant that specializes in psychological first aid and also psycho-spiritual therapy, as well as being a hospice chaplain as well. Uh, I'm so honored and grateful for all of you to be here today. We will have Q&A. So at the end of the event, we will be answering all the questions that you have. But we also ask you a very important um, mission statement that we have here. This is a safe place for everybody. We are safe for everybody, whoever you are, whatever you believe in, whatever land that you walk on. We want to welcome all of you here, but we don't want to welcome any hateful comments or hurtful questions because this is a place of learning and growing and working together to discuss mental health and the LGBTQ plus community. So I would like to welcome our two speakers, Amy and Jude, to join us for this event. If you can jump on in here. Um, these two individuals are amazing human beings. Uh, I am truly honored and grateful to have them here with us today. And again, if you have specific questions for Amy and Jude, uh, please put them in the chat and I will get to all of them at the end of the event. But Amy, I would love for you to introduce us to who you are and your journey to get to where you are right now. Good late afternoon, early evening. I am so happy to be here. Thank you to Simud for the invitation to be a part of this and to Ross for uh, interviewing both of us, both Jude and I on this wonderful webinar today. So I come to you from the Treaty 7 Nation of the Blackfoot people here in Alberta, the home of the Métis Region 3 as well. And I like to share that because I'm very blessed to be Canadian and also acknowledge that I wasn't here to begin with the first person to be here. It was the indigenous population. And how did I get to be here today? So my uh, story, Ross, yes, yes. Yes, please tell me, yeah, let's hear it. Awesome. So my journey started only a few, a few years ago. And in 2018, I was starting to have these dreams and full of color and symbols. I didn't really know what was going on. And I talked to a friend of mine who was a shaman. And my friend said, at that point, she's like, Amy, do you think you might be attracted to women and men? And I was like, no, I can't be. The reason why was because growing up, my mom and dad would make remarks about all oh, the boys. And they thought because I wore flannel plaid shirt and bandanas in my hair, that something must be going on. So I was so afraid. And I also found an email in the 90s from a family member to a friend of ours who had just come out as gay and they thought I was, but they couldn't tell. They couldn't tell, I didn't know. And the response from the email was, can you still love her though and accept her? The response I read was no. I don't know if that no is just from my one family member or everybody in the family as a whole. So my fear of coming out of the closet was really relevant and factual. I had evidence on reasons why. And it took me some going and working with a coach and I finally told my parents and my sister and then I came out publicly as bisexual. But last year, I was in a, a coaching call again with my coach and she looked at me through the computer screen and she's like, what do you need to tell me? I can tell that you are still holding on to something. What is it? Are you only attracted to women? And I started crying and nodding my head. She goes, okay, Amy, tell me that. And I did. And I did louder and louder till I can sit here, stand here and say, my name is Amy and I'm attracted to women, full stop. And, you know, since 
realizing that and who I am at my core, I've started dating. I did a couple of coffee dates last year. I didn't go anywhere. But in the summer of July this year, I met a woman, a beautiful woman, and we've actually been dating now since July. And Fantastic. A beautiful experience. And I just feel so loved and like learning to love myself at my core of who I am and accepting myself um, has been a big, a big journey, but full of love. That's amazing. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that and, and how you got here, which is amazing. And so Jude, I want to say first, thank you so much for being here this evening, uh, because it is late in the morning for you where you're located. So thank you so much for being here. And why don't you share with us uh, your story and journey to where you are today? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I am so happy or not to be here. So I was born in Brazil um in 1985 my mother was a model and uh well, since i was a kid i do think i was attracted to men just because i didn't have a male um how can i say um a male figure because my father was never in there uh, so i grow up uh, always with this thing of being attracted more to men um, until I was 18, basically 16, probably was the first kiss. And then at 18 years old, I just came out to my parents. And, and from there, I was completely open uh, to everything. But a um, few months ago, I just realized one big thing. Um, I never consider myself man or woman. Um, it was not a sort of dysphoria, but it was a sort of, okay, I take things from the women's side, things from the men's side, but I consider myself in the middle. So, uh, and then it came out, and I, I don't like labels, but then I could put a, actually a label that was uh, genderqueer. I was like, oh, wow, I'm a genderqueer. So I'm there in the middle. I can be this, I can be that, whatever I want. And, and yeah, it was like a beautiful journey of rediscovering and, uh, and at the same time of loving more and more myself uh, for all of that. Well, that's amazing. Wow. Well, you know, I, I always say thank you is not a big enough word, but to both of you, I really truly honored and grateful that you're here because, you know, we've talked previously beforehand before this webinar about how, how this discussion about mental health in the LGBTQ plus community is not talked about enough. It, it really isn't because sometimes in some cases we are fearful of discussing topics about communities that we're not a part of. I, I'm not a part of the community, even though I grew up in Vancouver, I grew up in a, in a hairdressing family. So in the LGBTQ plus community, I was always surrounded in it. And I never so, saw or was told that anyone was different. Everyone was the same. You know, we love who we love. And that's the beautiful thing is, is that loving is love, no matter what. It's love, that's it. There's no and or anything, it's love. And I found recently, and I want to ask both of you individually, because both of you in your talents and skills and career and journey on right now are working so hard and, and in a, such a prevalent, powerful way, but in two different countries, because we'll get to the different countries, because I think that's a topic that a lot of our listeners and viewers right now may be watching from different countries that things are a little bit different and things are a little bit, you know, in regards to things are okay or not okay. I found that through the pandemic, inclusiveness for a lot of us was being locked down and isolated. But in the LGBTQ plus community, isolation is something that they've always felt. And now with the pandemic, I feel that it's being felt even more isolated because of the pandemic and everyone being isolated. So Amy, you're, you work a lot with youth. And I wanna, I wanna know what, what your line of work and what you are seeing in what you're working with right now during this pandemic. Like what is the most prevalent thing that you're noticing working with the, the younger generation? Yeah, I have a, a private client that I've been working with for the past few months and it's really interesting. She is, one of the first things she said to me, she was like, I need to work on my self-confidence because I'm being bullied. And she wants to learn how to find her voice. And I said, perfect, we can do that. And um, 
yeah, the bullying, the mental health, early, like last year, 2020, when the first lockdowns and everything came into play, um, I was noticing that the mental health of children were rising in general. And we have something here in Canada called the Kids Help Phone. And it's a 24 hours a day, seven days a week hotline that people, kids can call for help and talk about anything and everything. And I read a statistic um, a month ago that said in March of 2020, the Kids Help Phone, their phone volume, call volume rose by 350%. And the main reason for the calls was isolation and other mental health concerns. So wow. it's there, it's prevalent, it's happening. And mm -hmm. that's why I'm so passionate about our youth, our younger youth, the 11 to 14 age, to really help them get in touch with who they are at their core and love themselves. Yeah. And, and that's so, tr so true. It's, it's extremely prevalent, uh, prevalent right now if, uh, in the youth and the younger generation with the LGBTQ community, because, you know, we'll get to it in a little bit, but that, that fear of being judged is still a very a large prevalent thing right now is judgment. Even myself being in the work that I'm in, having tattoos, it's continually being judged because it's, it's different from what I was told at a young age. You see something in a book, that's what it's supposed to be. Anything different is, is, is judgmental. So Jude, in your line of work, you, you do a lot of healing. You coach a lot of people in regards to healing. Tell us a little bit about your work right now and how your journey kind of really helped develop it into what you're doing right now. Yeah, so I do work as a transformational coach and a mindfulness master practitioner. I started this uh, four years ago, four or five years ago. Um, it came out from a grievance that was my father that passed away. Um, I uh, was living in London at that time and my life was a completely mess. Um, um, you know, um, as I said during our podcast together, um, when I moved to London, I didn't realize the cultural crash that I could have uh, in that. Plus, London is a huge uh, city and you are mostly alone. Um, and as much as you try to find your community, your group of people and all of that, most of the time you feel alone. And so I started to drink, have drugs and to the point to have an overdose. And my heart stopped for a few seconds. And I woke up in this room and the doctor looked at me and say, oh, hey, hi, welcome back. And I was like, okay, something happened in here. And in that room, there was no one. There was just myself. In the moment I started to uh, wake up versus life to really understand what, um, what as I, I was actually doing right and wrong, but at the same time, what I was missing. And I think that my biggest uh, uh, problem in that moment, it was acceptance. Um, I, was, uh, I was, everything that I was doing, I was in the center of attention just because I wanted to be accepted. So when I came back to Italy, my father unfortunately passed away. I, it was my moment, I had that click and was that moment of, okay, I needed to stand up, I needed to heal, I needed to learn more about myself, and I've done this uh, beautiful walk in Scotland that is called the West Highland Way. It was 160 kilometers by myself in the middle of the nature. It was a beautiful and at the same time really hard thing to do since I don't do sports or anything like that. So I was not just with the backpack, like walking. And and while I was walking, I felt uh, this beautiful connection with myself and I felt I could give more to people. So I started my uh, qualification as a life coach, mindfulness master practitioner, yoga nidra, and many other things, addiction counselor as well. And I created what is called Healing with Jude here in Italy, even if I mostly work with people uh, from all over the world. Um, because my, my message is that um, I think that the world gives to you a different perspective of happiness. Like if you watch the television, basically you are happy just brushing your teeth with some strange brand, but it's nothing like that. It's much more 
your happiness is different from anyone else and it's good to open up, look inside and uh, be really connected uh, to what you have around because every one of us, we're going to have bad days and it's totally fine. It's part of the game. Uh, but when you are aware of this, that is the healing, that is the awareness and that is the acceptance as well. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's first of all, that West Highland Walk, I've done it. It, uh, <laughs> it was very difficult. Um, I was a sports guy. For some reason, I thought it would be easy. I really was proven wrong. <laughs> and it was a great walk, <laughs> but very eye opening, very spiritual, very enlightening, having, you know, that experience in nature. But, you know, when we did our podcast, Amy and, and Jude, we, we talked about two kind of big prevalent things was that approval or appreciation of being yourself and the I am. And the biggest thing is, is that we live in a world where when we're born, we need that approval. You know, when we walk for the first time, we look to our parents and go, yeah, did I do a good job through school, through love, through life, through work, through career? Even, you know, in my line of work at the end of life, you know, journey, we always seek that approval because we need someone to tell us that, hey, we're doing a good job. You're on the right path. You're in the right community. You're the right person. But in some cases, we, we live our lives trying to get the approval from others when, in fact, the only approval that we need is ourselves. You know, we are the ones looking for approval from ourselves. We are so fearful of being our true selves because we live in a society where being different is still very scary in, in, in the community, in, in anything, even thinking out of the box. If someone says to you, what did you think of this movie? And you say, I didn't like it. What? No, that's, you can't not like it. Of course you loved it. It's like, no, I didn't. No, 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 you did. So we're always seeking that approval. And being in London, we, we go to these cities where we think, hey, listen, from the outside, London on a poster, like Jude and I were talking about in our podcast, is the poster of London, it looks fantastic. Everyone's welcome. Everyone looks great. But inside, the actual movie is, it's not the same. So you look at these places where you think like Canada, for example, the automatic reaction is Canada is welcoming to everybody. Everybody is welcomed. No matter who you are, you're so welcomed. And in some cases, maybe we're not as welcoming as we think because the poster is beautiful, but the movie itself, the credits, the people, maybe not as, a, you know, as supportive. Now with Amy, because you're in Calgary, you work really heavily in the community there with the police and also, you know, organizations on the board. Do you think, and this is a hard question, but do you think Canada is doing enough to be supportive and helping those in the community be their true self? No. Great answer. Um, <laughs> education and awareness for businesses and companies is still wild, widely needed. Um, here where I live in Alberta, it's very much, it's very redneck um, country. And, you know, people think, oh, Calgary is a beautiful city and it's so friendly and it's so welcoming. And, you know, everyone talks about who's not from Calgary talks about the stampede which is 10 days of craziness in my opinion <laughs> and it's 10 days of that western hospitality which is true and that is a thing and you know i like the stampede i, I used to go a while ago but i don't go anymore um yet there are those microaggressions that still happen in my city where i call home now and i, I would love to share uh, a microaggression story, if if that's okay. Please, uh, please. Yeah. So, um, with the pandemic, we all know we have to wear masks going into different places and so on and so forth. So, this past May, May of 2021, I was wearing my mask, getting ready to go into a store. Really, like I was two blocks from my house, like two blocks from my condo. So I was in my immediate community of where I live. And the mask I had on is all black with a rainbow heart and it says pride 2020 on it. And I was crossing the street and I saw this man on the other side of the road just staring at me and just like glaring at me like that line if looks could kill I'd be dead. Yeah. And just looking at me and I get across the road. And I have one more block to go to get to the store. But this man looks at me on his pedestal 
soapbox. He was spouting his feelings and his thoughts and his opinions. And he looked at me and he pointed and he's like, you're going to go burn in hell. Wow. I was like, I'm two blocks from my doorstep. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel safe anymore in my neighborhood because, because of this microaggression, which still happens. And the police service counts that as actually would be a hate crime. And if I had chosen to say something to the police, then they would be able to not do anything, but at least document it to show the city of Calgary that look hate crime to the, to the LGBT community is still happening. Technically, I still could do that. Like I could approach our police service and just let them know what happened back in May if I choose to. Um, so like circling back around, like education and awareness is so needed. Diversity training is needed. Um, that's one thing I want to get in, get into doing more of, like, yes, working with the youth, but also doing more education to businesses and people and about diversity in the LGBT community. So my answer is no, Canada has, yeah. we're good and there's room for improvement. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, we're, we're like, I agree with you. The education is absolutely needed um, in all facets from the younger generation to, to now it is definitely needed because again, growing up in Canada, I was born in Vancouver. I grew up in Canada. History was Canadian. You learned about Canada, but you didn't learn about the real Canada, the diverse Canada, because you're learning about things that are going to help you grow and become a better person, a better Canadian, but they miss out things. And I always look at it this way. It's like, I would rather provide the younger generation with all the information possible and let them decide, allow them to decide what they want to read and what not read. It's better to have too much information than not enough. And Jude, you living in Italy, now it's amazing because when we talked about you know, each other, we all talked before this webinar and on the podcast, living in Italy is one of the places where I would assume that is very welcoming because it's fashion capital of the world. It's, it's one of these places where you see all these fashion magazines. It's so, you know, on the TV side of things, it's, it seems like a welcoming place. But tell us a little bit about your journey being in Italy and the, you know, the pros and cons about what's going on there in the community itself. Um, so I think that lots of people think that Italy is really open um, to the LGBTQ community, uh, but it's actually not. Um, meaning that um, we don't have any kind of law or any kind of uh, help if something happened. There is a lot of violence. And it's not just with the community, also with women's. Um, um, and in fact, uh, what I shared uh, with both of you, it was that um, two months, two or three months ago, um, there was the opportunity to have a law that would help uh, the, the community, uh, women's, but also minorities, um, when it's happened, uh, things like violence and all of that. And then um, it didn't happen. And the funny fact, it's funny, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite British humor, uh, but um, it was uh, the funny fact it was that in the moment that the politician decided no, they just stand up and they just cheer as they've done something so beautiful, saying no to, um, not just for the community, but also for the women's and also for uh, minorities. So I, I came in this country when I was 10 years old. Um, it was quite difficult because um, Italy is quite racist. And I came to this little town. Um, I was the only mixed race uh, in the school. Uh, my mother was considered the gold digger that came and married this Italian man. Um, I couldn't speak Italian at all. Uh, but, you know, when you are a kid, it's much more easier. So um, in two or three months, I could not speak perfectly or fluently, but I couldn't understand or at least, you know, um, say something different from Brazilian words. And um, but still, I was considered the black one in that. Uh, then, you know, I, um, I was really open to my sexuality um since i was that 10 years 11 years old um but i think that is much more connected to the brazilian roots 
um, that we are really open about sexuality and all of that. Uh, but when I came out as a gay boy uh, to my classmates, uh, they just started to call me with uh, really horrible names and all of that. And growing, um, it was a sort of, and um, it was sort of strange because I, as I said many times, I didn't give monkeys about uh, what, what people was thinking about me. Um, so even if they were calling me black or call me uh, gay, it was not affecting me at all. Uh, but at the same time, it was also difficult to, to uh, find a job. Uh, firstly, it was difficult to uh, be inside the, the community. And I've been a drag queen in 2008 and I won this championship, but there was a lot of hate in that uh, part of a community as well. and. Um, and right now, uh, when I see the LGBTQ uh, plus community here in Italy, there is a lot of hate um, as well, um, not just against others, but also against themselves. So I think that the com there is a huge lack of communication and, um, and there is a lot of violence as well uh, in all of that. There was something completely different because living in London, yes, they are all open. There is still violence. There is still uh, many little things, but um, at the same time, you could be whatever you wanted to be. Uh, and instead in Italy, I do what I want, but there are a lot of people in here that unfortunately they don't come out. They don't live that life as they wanted to to be and uh, and to share just because they are afraid of that judgment and they are afraid of uh, lose everything because sometimes you hear stories here in Italy where someone just come out and the family just try to kill them or the family just try to um, ruin their life and they just need to escape and all of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite, it's kind of difficult because Again, um, well, I find that 2021, uh, we are supposed to be over it, some stuff like this, uh, but instead you can, here you can still leave them, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, again, it kind of goes back to that kind of thought of being in London or being in Canada. We, we make the assumption that it's very welcoming because of what we see. But in some cases, what you were saying, Jude, is so prevalent is the lack of communication, the lack of education is because, again, to this day, being different is still used the word different. And I'm not a fan of the word different as I'm not a fan of the word normal, uh, because really, I don't believe in labels in general. But using this kind of connotation different is something that is utilized so so much. And in regards to the mental health side of things, I remember being diagnosed at, a, at a, the youngest age with dyslexia, mental health, PTSD, all these things like that at a young age. And I knew at a very beginning prior to having all these experiences and all this support networks now, back then they didn't have the, the social media, they didn't have the, the information like that, they didn't have websites that you can go to or hotlines, things like that. You were, de you were being defined by who you were at that young age. I was different. So I knew that that stigma, that that label would be continuing for the rest of my life. So I've already automatically given myself a title of I'm different. I'm going to struggle no matter what I try to do. And that's a real, a big thing right now is, is that giving that support network and connection and information education is so prevalent, so powerful. But yet, even in these modern times, we are still struggling. And when you came out, Jude, at a younger age, you know, having those struggles of being different with the skin tone, you know, being different, having different thoughts and talking about things like that is, is so powerful. But with Amy, you, your story is similar, but you, you had a coming out journey, a coming out experience not that long ago. So what was that like? Because you have those stories of kids saying, you know, when I was younger, uh, 10, 12, 15, 20, but your coming out story was, was quite recently. Did you find that a little bit easier or harder? Harder. Yeah. Okay. Harder because, you know, like 
if I zoom out and look at my life as a teenager and a young person in university, yeah, there were a few signs. Like, for example, um, I was a lifeguard. And one of the shows I loved to watch was Baywatch. Yet I wasn't looking back, since I'm looking back at it now, I wasn't watching David Hasselhoff so much. I was watching the other women actresses. I forget all their names, but those ladies. And, you know, there was just little signs that I can see now. And the hard part too, for me was, you know, I dated boys and, and men, um, a couple boys I dated in high school. I had an abusive boyfriend at university. And then here in Calgary, when I moved here in 2000, I had, you know, a couple of, of men who were boyfriends as well. So for me to tell my parents at age 42, that at that point I'm bisexual, it, it was a struggle to say, although my parents took it very, very well. I'm very grateful that they were, um, they still are like accepting and, and loving. And they said to me, my mom wrote back when I wrote them an email telling them this, that mom said to me, she's like, Amy, you would tell us when you were ready. And I guess you're ready. So it's an experience. Everybody's journey is their own journey. And everybody's journey looks different. Whether, whether you're, you know, 14, like 12 or 13, or you're my age in your 40s and realizing, wait a second, something, something's shifting and knowing that all of it is okay. And, and it's so, it's such a powerful topic. It's, it's every It's so powerful because even outside of the community myself, I struggled being different because obviously being in the line of work that I am, tattoos, thinking differently, thinking out of the box when it comes to spirituality, faith and religion is something that is a no-no, is a taboo, it is a, a, a taboo. And, you know, with you being in Italy, do you find that the in regards to the laws or lack of their laws and, and, the, and the lack of information, the lack of support in the LGBTQ plus community. Do you find that being in Italy, the, the home of faith and religion, you, know, you have the Pope there. Do you find that that is a big part of the misunderstanding and lack of support? Oh yes, completely. Like 100%. Like, um, and, and I do the, the example in my family, like, um, Every time, like every time that we are together, they have this strange way to say. And last time I just was like, you know, you can call me, like, don't be worried. Um, so I have um, a boyfriend, we are six years together. And, um, and every time that uh, we go to have lunch or dinner and um, at my family house, there is always my auntie that she struggled to say um, your boyfriend or your companion. She said your friend. And she's like, oh, I don't know what to say because, you know, I don't want to be uh, judged just not by you, but also by God and all mm -hmm. of that. And I'm like, uh, well, uh, you can call me whatever you want and you will not be judged by that. And um, the... The, 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 the Vatican, they are not helpful with all of that because when in Italy, uh, we basically in Italy, you can marry it. Uh, um, um, well, you can marry if it's in couple, you can marry it. But when they were doing the law about it, and I'm talking about four or five years ago, the, um, there was the Vatican saying, oh, this is not normal. You know, so imagine that I think that the 80% of the Italian people, they just are really attached to church mm -hmm. because it is, it is a sort of community, you know, uh, like uh, when you are a kid, you go to these, um, uh, to these camp, camps uh, that is, is, uh, is provided by the church and by uh, your community or the place where you live. And so people really do believe in that. And um, since there is this huge lack of communication and this huge lack of education as well, 
about um, the community, the, who is a gay person, who is a lesbian, transsexual, and all of that. Um, every time that you are different, they see you in a strange way. And um, when you shared about uh, the mental health, uh, so when I was 25, I, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And for me, it was just, I was just sharing with everyone. Well, I'm a bipolar, I'm a bipolar. And when I came to Italy and I said that in Italy, when you say that you are in depression, if you have any, if you are going to a therapist or if you, um, anyway, anxiety and all of that, people look to you in a really strange way because they think that you are crazy. So when I was like saying normally, well, I'm a bipolar. So that's why today I am in this terrible mood. Uh, people will look at me like in a face of suffering, like I'm sorry for you because you are crazy. Mm -hmm. And this is also connected to the um, Catholic way that they live in here. So because if you are crazy, God is supposed to help you in some way. So they literally say to you, I'm praying for you. That's something that I hate. But they yeah. say, I will pray for you. And you're like, okay, for what? <laughs> what are you trying to give to myself? But here, yeah, like in Italy, the, the religion is quite huge. And, and you can't even be from a different religion because also... Uh, there is always debates about Muslim, there is always debates about uh, Buddhism and all of that, because like the main, the main is Catholic, like they, they just took out the cross from each uh, classroom just a few years ago, because um, they wanted, you know, the school to have the cross in there. So, um, and, and, and people, they are, not enough educated here so they see um, just that part of connection with something and if it's different from that is not accepted at all yeah and and it's difficult because it's one of the things that i find quite prevalent in the work the work that i do in regards to being a hospice chaplain being a chaplain and doing work in end-of-life care and, and diverse communities, multicultural communities, is that fear of thinking differently. We are so fearful of being different because in some cultures, being different is suffering. You are suffering because you're not your true self. You're going through the process of suffering to find your true I am, your true self, your true me. But the suffering is not being your true self. So a lot of the times in some countries and, and, and communities is when people are trying to be something they're not, that is true suffering. Not being your true self is the purest form of suffering. So when people are saying, oh, you're suffering, it's like, I'm not suffering being myself. I'm suffering hiding myself from you because I'm so scared of what you think. And in some cases, a lot of people say, well, that's because, you know, that country is backwards. It's, it's, it's older. It's not growing yet. You know, the, you know, the city is older. Mentality is older. The baby boomers are still there. So they're kind of manipulating the education system, things like that. But in some cases, some of the most modern places are still quite behind with that. And Amy, I'll, I'll talk to you about this is because something that we talked about before is conversion therapy. Now, a lot of people that talk about conversion therapy, and you can you know, touch on this, Amy, because you, you have a wonderful thought on this, is you'd like to think in a place like Canada that's developed and it's modern, and it's going, it's going, that conversion therapy of all things would have already been you know, taken care of, that this wouldn't be something that is still a topic of conversation, but this literally just happened. Yes, you're right, Ross. It literally just happened a week ago, maybe two weeks ago at most, that the House of Commons and then the Senate, the highest power of form of government and lawmakers in Canada, have decreed that conversion therapy is against the law in Canada. And I have a few friends that are survivors of conversion therapy, and you know what they went when they have shared their journey of what they went through, it's, it's horrifying. Um, you know, an example that I've heard and read about and done some research to learn myself about what this is and was, is, you know, kids were pulled out of their homes if the parents 
thought they were gay or lesbian or what have you, and they were brought to a, a camp or even just a different house, not in their hometown, and they were, you know, like I, I know here in Canada we have the phrase of with the residential school survivors and everything of beat the Indian net of the child. Same thing with the LGBT community. It's beat the gay out of the kid because being gay is wrong. Mm -hmm. To put it very bluntly and very matter of factly, that's what was happening. That is what conversion therapy is or was. And I know here in Alberta and Calgary, it became law a couple of years ago. And now it's across Canada. And I think I'm very happy that it is because it was it was very church dominant. And then also I've heard that the psychologists got in on things and electric th electric shock therapy was used to try mm. and zap it out of the kid of being homosexual. So there's just a lot around it. And there's other topics um, about, you know, with the history of, we mentioned the history of Canada and when the residential schools were happening, there was also something happening called the purge. And that was the military police and the RCMP and the military of wherever your province is interviewing people who were potentially gay or lesbian and they were being fired because of who they were. And this was happening in the 1980s. You know, <laughs> I'm never usually lost for words, but I have been lost for words in this discussion. And because it's silly because we, we think to ourselves, we are in a time right now where everything is good. You can be who you are. You can say what you want and freedom, social media, all these things like that. Everything is great. But yet to this extent, everything is not great. We are still in the process of really going backwards in regards to the LGBTQ plus community. We are still treating people as different as suffering, but in fact is, is that if we truly educate each other, if we're able to actually educate the younger generation, be, be able to provide the information to diverse learning, talking about LGBTQ plus community in high schools, in elementary schools, in colleges, discussing diversity, even not even in the community, but in general about people who are so-called different, being their true I am, if we had that ability to educate the young generation in the organizations that they're at, the schools, online, even TV, things like that, we would be able to provide a lot more information and a lot more ease for people who are trying to come out, coming into their journey. The LGBT plus community that I work with as well, they've always felt so inclusive. They felt so much shut in that they're reluctant to get support. They're reluctant to get the medical checks because they feel that they're targeted. So during this pandemic, it's even worse because they're staying in the community. They're, they're not leaving because of fear of being judged because of where they're living, the, the, the faith community or family in general. Their families themselves are making them feel very isolated because, again, the family is not educated enough. They're not even educated as parents, as guardians, they're not educated. And in some cases you think to yourself, there has to be a school of diversity, a school of cultural differences, of thought different, a school of everybody says whatever they want and everybody goes, oh, okay, let's talk about that. And you know, it's, it's so hard to think that that hasn't been developed yet. And in this modern time that there isn't a educational model that allows people to say whatever they want about who they truly are. And we can say, well, tell me about that. I, I want to learn like we're doing right now. The powerful conversations that we're having, we have amazing questions right now that are so powerful because we are talking in a safe place, openly, honestly, because Simon is giving us the platform to be who we are, to talk openly without fear of being judged. This is a wonderful experience. These questions are really powerful and I wanna to get to them because I think right now, this will be a great way of discussing openly with each other about these. So the first question is more of a thought too as well. Um, I'm an end of life doula in Edmonton, Alberta. I do that as well. Thank you so much for the work that you do. That's not easy. Region, my heart breaks that the LGBT community is often isolated at the end of their life and even on their deathbeds. It's incomprehensible to me that some families have hearts of stone. I mean, yeah. I, isn't that amazing that to that extent, even at the most vulnerable, delicate time of your life, the end of life, 
even then you are still so-called suffering. You are still hesitant of being your true self at the last moment. That is so powerful. Jude, you, you have something about that? Oh well, yeah, like um, I was watching this series, it's a Spanish series, it's called uh, Veneno, and is the uh, story of this um, trans, uh, trans woman um, that basically she was really famous in Spain. She was like a, a, a big name in that. And um, there was this uh, scene by the end because she passed away and the family uh, decided to bury her with his name. So they were not accepting the fact that she was a trans woman. And, um, and this is like quite difficult. Like there are so many, um, as much as we do have information because we watch series, we watch movies and all of that, we are still not open to see on things as this one. You know, so it's always like, wow, why, why, on, as you said, on that last day that I'm on this earth, how is possible that I can be accepted? You know, we talk a lot about acceptance, but in the end of the day, people around us probably we don't, it's not, don't accept who we are. And then we finished in that strange and sort of way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, end of life doula, you know, working in the hospice community in the palliative care, I, I I always interact with individuals that they're, a lot of the time they're looking towards what's next, of course, at their end of life journey, but they're also in a lot of cases that of, of people I've spoken to is, I wish I got the acceptance from family about who I am, about what I thought. I wish I could tell my family the things that were in my heart, the things that were in my head. I wish, I wish, I wish. And it's terrible to think that even in that most vulnerable, fragile time, we are still thinking to ourselves, I wish I said more. I wish I had that support. The one thing I always say is at that time, say it all, say everything, because we are here together. If you're alone, we are here. We are in a safe place. Say it. And these questions that are coming in are so powerful because we are in a safe place. We can ask questions and not be fearful of getting some sort of reaction that we've had all our lives. And the next question is for both you and Amy. Um, it's a really great question. What tools did you use to overcome the struggles in your adolescent years? And also are the struggles different now that you're an adult? And Amy, I'll, I'll go for you first. Yeah, so part of my growing up years is, you know, I was severely teased and bullied between grades three and grade eight. And the struggles there were what the children were calling me, what the teachers were saying about me. And those negative tapes, you know, sometimes still play on my heart as a 45 year old woman today. And what I've recently come to realize, if I am shifting my language and my, my, way of speaking love is that, you know, the teachers and my peers when I was growing up, they didn't see or understand or believe and recognize my unique brilliance of who I am today now and also that young person back then. And um, the struggles are real, if especially if you're an adult, we'll say an adult survivor of childhood bullying it takes a lot of work on yourself to mm -hmm. get better. Yeah, and, and Jude, I'll ask the same question on your end too as well. Um, this is a great question because I, <laughs> so when I was a teenager, we did just have MTV. <laughs> that was the only thing. Um, there was no um, internet, or at least if it was uh, here in Italy, it was super expensive. And uh, there was, uh, and it was okay to bully it somehow. Um, that is bad to say, but it was okay. Like, mm -hmm. and you know, just the bully situation just came after all of that. 
I think that one of the tools that I used when I happened to be bullied or when it happened to me to um, scream out loud to people like, I don't care what you're thinking about, it was to look to myself in the mirror and start to accept my details. You know, for a long time, because of my color skin, I wanted to be white. And for a long time, I wanted to be something else to don't suffer when they were saying gay to me. Uh, but then I started just to look to the mirror and say, oh, hey, you do look beautiful. <laughs> it's a, you, you look amazing. Um, sometimes I do still have the struggles like this um, nowadays. And I think that is normal. It's part of life. Sometimes you just live through self-doubt instead of self-acceptance. Uh, but the, the difference between uh, then and now is... Uh, the awareness, like I am aware that that day I will have that self-doubt. So I look myself in the mirror and I'm like, you know what? Just live through the self-doubt for five minutes and just do something else. <laughs> that, um, that is the tool that I use nowadays. Well, yeah, I think that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, I I'm learning so much from this. It, it, you know, I, I I I forget that other people are watching because it's such a great conversation. Because you you think you understand as much as you can, but you still learn every single day, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, another another question is for both of you as well. Is I'm a service provider serving two S L L G B T Q I A plus identified newcomers. I totally agree. What have been said, education is important. My biggest challenge is for many newcomers, homosexuality is such a taboo topic in their culture. Any suggestions on how can I engage this topic? That is a topic of amazing discussion because we are living in a world of multicultural, multidiversity, different thoughts, different faith based, all these things like that. And that is a very powerful question. Amy, what are your thoughts on that one? Well, first of all, thank you to the person who asked it for the work that they do, um, working with newcomers coming to the country that where he lives. What comes to mind first is facilitating and creating a safe space. Um, example, putting up a rainbow flag or a trans flag in your open community space, wherever you're, you're working in. And letting others know that this is a safe space to ask questions to to be yourself to to be okay loving example if you're a woman loving another woman or being attracted to another woman and just doing as they said like that education piece and turning it into other languages and transposing it into languages for all people to understand who are coming to your country from other countries that may not speak the the native language of your country yeah, and, and Jude, I'll, I'll pass that question on to you as well. Yeah, um, I think uh, that me coming from different culture and learning and, and having anyway that taboo, it was to um, look for people that changed the story about being uh, gay, about being lesbian, about being a trans, uh, transgender, not binary, and all of that. I think that when you show to someone else how someone had such a strong uh, power to change little by little something that was so taboo, people will start to understand better. And I'm, and um, in any culture, in any nation, there is always someone that it was the pioneer of that. So it's good to go in there and to learn about, and in this way, you can actually talk about this topic because that person probably went through a lot, but at the same time, people remind that person for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very true. And, and I think, you know, the pandemic has shown one thing that we are still lacking that compassion, empathy, and kindness, because we are still in that process of judging people for thinking differently, for being differently. The pandemic, the, the thought process about 
where we're going, what choices you make, things like that. I remember having a conversation with someone yesterday about being fearful of thinking about the pandemic differently than somebody in their community or differently somebody in their household. And that is a conversation that should be an open discussion about your choice. What is your choice? Why are you choosing that decision? Is it to better yourself or to better somebody else? And in the LGBTQ plus community, it's the same thing. Are you choosing to hide because fear of someone else? Or you know, is your community hindering you from being yourself? Is your family hindering you from being your true self? And, it's, and it's, it's hard to think that in some cases, people in the community will run away from home because of that fear of being judged from within a safe environment or a so-called safe environment. And I know in different multicultural faiths, that is a giant issue is because thinking differently outside of their faith is so scary for them to think that way that they hide it and they they truly suffer and in some cases mental health flares up and then you have the issues of suicide and drug addiction and alcoholism because they are so fearful of speaking their true i am that they are suffering from within to do so and that's very difficult amy this this is a question for you what is the best approach to help a close friend find her courage to tell her family she is interested in women? She is in her early 50s. That's so that a, is a late journey as well. That's a late journey as well. And that's a beautiful question. What's coming to me is I thinking of my journey when I first started. And when my coach said to me, when are you going to tell your parents? And it was in a group class I was in with her and some other women. And it's all about getting truthful in who you are and knowing that speaking your truth is the key to your own happiness. And when I was writing my email, my letter to my parents, I'm pretty sure I put something to that line in the letter saying, you know, my truth is more important than me living in fear. My truth is more important than me staying silent. I love you. Here's my truth. And at that point, I wrote, I'm bisexual with a lean to the feminine. And I had known about that for a year. And me as, you know, an adult child, because my parents are still alive in their 70s, you know, growing up even, they want me to be happy. And they told me that, Amy, we just want you to be happy. So I'm hoping to the one who's asking about how do I support my friend who's in her 50s is, I'm hoping that growing up, her family just wanted her to be happy and to be happy with herself and to start looking, seeking out opportunities to get involved in the community, perhaps. Um, I know here in Calgary, there's a few different places. So look in the hometown where they are. Um, there's also great resources online um, for seniors who are part of the LGBT community. Now, senior I know is not 50, yet, you know, there's others, there's organizations, but what it really comes down to is getting comfortable in your core and knowing who you are. Because part of my journey too was that internal homophobia of being mm -hmm. afraid of myself because of growing up for so many years as an adult thinking I'm attracted to boys. Well, that's all now going in the garbage and I felt mm -hmm. like an alien. So, getting in touch with yourself at your core and loving who you are. And then how I did it too, this might help as well as I started with not my immediate, immediate family, but I started with two cousins and then I came into my sister and then I went to my parents. So start with somebody you trust in your family unit and then work your way into the one that's going to be the most hard, which might be a sibling, might be a parent and, and, just remember you're speaking your truth and the truth is what, you know, your truth is more important than you living in fear. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's so true is I think that's great wisdom, Amy, on in regards to building that courage is starting with individuals that have that supportive backing for you, building up that wall, building up that shield of courage. So when you do reach those individuals who, you know, might be a little bit of a struggle, um, you have that supportive system. And the wonderful thing about the community is, is that you always will have that solid foundation of friends and loved ones in your community. Wherever you are, there is groups. You may be in a country that's very small, but there will be a group of friends or people that you can rely on that's like, hey, 
I have my foundation. I have some barriers and strength. So I think that's really powerful. Jude, so I have a question for you, uh, which is a great question and actually a question that I, I would ask you as well. Would you consider moving to another more accepting country to feel more safe in being yourself? Uh, no, <laughs> no, um, um, I do think that when you are open to yourself and when you accept yourself for who you are, uh, you can be anywhere in the world. Um, in my case, I've been to countries also for working where they didn't accept gay people. And I do remember going to this country and they say to me, oh, you are not supposed to dress in this way or talk in this way. And I was like, you know what? I don't give monkeys about it because this is me. And if something happened, that's fine. But this is me. I will not change who I am to to be okay where, where, um, where I'm supposed to be. Um, I do think that nowadays uh, there are, um, you can be everywhere, but if you are not okay with yourself, you will not feeling good anywhere. So you can move to as many countries as you want, also the one that would accept you, um openly and all of that but if you don't feel good with yourself also that country and that place it will not be uh good for yourself um i moved to italy uh, we are considering to move to spain uh but it's just the fact of living a life with not much stressful content I do think that after this, uh, well, after, it's not finished yet, but in these two years, and hopefully just this, um, many people, they just woke up to the fact that life is one and um, we are supposed to live it um, openly and with more calm. And in Italy, there is a lot of stressful situations, um, but for anyone, for anyone in general, and so me and my boyfriend, we said, oh, we should move to a place where you actually wake up and everyone is smiling. So I was like, why not Spain? Uh, I, I think that we, we will do this moving because we are accepting ourselves. And I am so sure that if one of us, we were in a place of um, having uh, issues inside, I don't want to share and all of that, it will not be that happy to go and to move to anyone else. You need to accept yourself always. And when you do this, it's much more easier for yourself, not for others, but for yourself to be wherever you want to be. And perfectly said, because, you know, it is the great question is, you know, would you move to somewhere that's a more supportive, that's, that's a, place where you wake up and you smile and you think to yourself, you know, yes, you could do that, but how many times and how many years will you keep running? And it's that mentality of sometimes you have to stop and look in the mirror and say, I can't run anymore. I am me. I am my true I am. I am my true self. I love who I am. I love my community. I love where I am and the people that are surrounded. I am going to stick with it. And you, and you look at some countries, you know, that are, you know, Eastern Europe and things like that, that are, you know, are really, really against, you know, coming out and in the an LGBTQ community and that fear of what could happen if I'm truly myself. And then you see a glimmer of light of community standing up even against the most disheartening laws ever, ever seen in, in humanity in for people, human rights violations to the extreme. And you see a glimmer of hope with these, you know, individuals standing up saying, I'm not leaving. I, I am I am here. This is where I'm from. This is where I was born. This is where I'm going to die. This is I am here. And you think to yourself, that is the kind of boost and that mentality of courage that you want to see. And we need in the media to report more on that, to show courage. What is it like to stand up and say, no, I'm not leaving it. It's very powerful. And 
we need to see more of that if I'm not running anymore. This is where I want to live. This is who I want to be. And it's it's amazing. And I have a, another question, but also sort of a comment and a discussion that we've talked about, which is which is I think is great. I get that you want to educate the young and new, but the elderly community that are in the LGBTQ plus are suffering because we are invisible. It is like that at your age, you are not LGBTQ as you are older. So in some cases, it's it's very true. The older you get, you're not seen in the LGBTQ plus community. And in some cases, some people would say, well, you're mature, you've probably grown out of it. So Amy, do you think that's true? Do you think in some cases the older community in the LGBTQ plus is seen as invisible because they're older? This is supposed to be something that young people do, not older people? Yes, no. So in a way, yes, because they may be not as active in their community because of health or mobility issues or so on and so forth but that doesn't make them less gay mm -hmm. it doesn't make them less of who they are i know here in calgary we have an organization that and i might get the name wrong but i think it might be called end of the rainbow and it's for seniors who are part of the lgbt community and they gather and they, they do things and then the no is because i with the work I've done and the board I sit on with the Calgary Police Service, like I've met so many people that are senior to me in age and are still very active in the community and you still see them at events and they're they're speaking. And I don't know if she's still alive, but here in Calgary, um, I've learned that a park very close to actually where I live has been named after a woman who was a pioneer in the LGBT community here in Calgary. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a yes and no to, to answer that question. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it's true. It's, it is a, I guess everything is sort of like a yes and no is because we want to say yes, but in some cases it's like, no, it's, it's not there yet. And, and yes, it is getting better. No, it's not. And this is why this discussion is so powerful. And, and again, thank you so much for everyone for asking these questions because it again takes courage to do this. It takes courage for you to type in the questions, to, to be here, be present with us. So I thank you so much. And this is another powerful question and I thank them very much for asking. I recently discovered a few months ago that I'm attracted to both men and women. I'm bisexual. I've only come out to a few people in my life. The only thing I'm worried about is that I may not seem bisexual slash queer enough, and I may be viewed as too greedy. I've only dated one guy, and I feel like I shouldn't claim the label bisexual because I've never been with a woman. How do I deal with this inner struggle and in, in, internalize biphobia? And, and Jude, I'll pass that to you uh, first. I I... I think that we give to ourselves too many labels sometimes, and um, you just need to be yourself. Um, you don't need to, um, I think that uh, one of the biggest thing when you're coming out is the fact that you wanted to scream out loud to everyone who you are, uh, but you don't need to do that because the only person that you need to scream out loud is to yourself. Um, there is nothing greedy and there is nothing bisexual or queer or anything. If you feel in that way, this is the best point because you are aware of what you are inside of you. And even if there will be thousands of people that will probably point the fingers against you and say maybe what you're saying, if you are true to yourself, that is the best thing that you can do, you know? Um, bit like human loves to judge, and but you need to just understand that, like it's, it's in the human nature to judge, but if, if you don't judge yourself and if you are open to who you are, that is the, big, the biggest thing. And, and to deal with the inner struggle is just write to yourself a letter, just write down how you're feeling, what are your emotions, your sensations, because most of the time um, we don't like to uh, be part of our emotions. 
that's why we feel the struggle inside. Instead, if you just write down a letter and you, in the moment you say to yourself, I am not judging. And if you have that voice saying to you, oh, why are you writing this? Just say, hey, uh, this is not your time. You can stay there in the corner and I'm gonna write. If you do this type of things, you will be much more open to what you have inside of you. So just maybe write the letter, read it out loud. And whenever people, um, if any people will come and judge, is their problem, it's not your problem because you are really open and present to yourself. Beautiful, absolutely fantastic. And Amy, I'll pass it on to you as well. Yeah. Um... The part about too greedy kind of caught my eye. And uh, when a person is bisexual, that is also a choice. Mm -hmm. And they can love and be attracted to a woman and a man. I have a couple of friends who are identifying as bisexual. And it's, they're not being greedy. They're uh, a friend of mine, when I was just starting to figure out myself in 2018, a friend of mine was like, Amy, you have best of both worlds. You can like go after both. Like <laughs> it's totally up to you on where you want to go and play mm -hmm. and, and be. And I like what uh, Jude said as well about the, the whole label thing. Um, yeah, I don't always say I'm a lesbian. I say more often that I'm a, I'm, I'm a woman who's attracted to women. Right. And I, you know, it's funny because we, we talk so powerfully about labels. And I think at a very young age, you're, you're ingrained in your kind of mindset and your cognitive mindset that you have to be something. So what are you? So I remember someone talking to me about, I have to be something. And when, when someone says to me, they said, you know, what is your name? Ross. And who are you? Ross. I know, but what, what are you? Like, what do you do? And things like that. It's very difficult for someone to just say, well, I'm just me. I am. That is enough. And people would look at you like going, well, no, you have to be something. What, what else are you? You can't just be you. You have to be this or you're you know, bisexual, queer, gay, all these kind of things like that. No, I, I'm just me, the true me. And in some cases, we make labels because we have to show people and educate people on these labels, which is beautiful, which is powerful because education is absolutely key from the moment you are born to the day you die. Education is key on everything. But labels in some cases, I think, really do hinder us from being our true selves because what if we don't fit in that label? There could be a million labels, but none of them represent who we are. So why can't we just be our true self without having to say and? And I think that's the, the biggest thing is, is like, my name is Jude and I'm like, no, I'm Jude. My name is Amy and no, I'm Amy. That's it. But we live in a world where we have business cards that have titles because we just can't have a business card that says your name. It doesn't work that way. Social media, you have to have a bio. You can't just say your name because people want to know what you support, what you don't support and what title you call yourself so they can again determine how they see you. And in some cases, labels will make people see you that label, but in fact, it's not. It's not a representation of yourself. This is a powerful uh, question that we have. This is the last question that we have, and it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful question for both of you, and I love your thoughts on this one. I am a lesbian working in a child care system, and I continue to see discrimination against the LGBTQ community. How can we support children and families? Flags, posters, books in the classroom isn't enough. I continue to experience families and co-workers displaying hate against our community. So Jude, I will, I will start with you. What are your thoughts on that? Because I, I do see that too as well. And that is definitely something that is needing more discussion. Yeah. Um, I think that um, like, um, and I was thinking about this um, this afternoon. Um, when there is, when you watch television and you watch a movie or a series and there is anyone uh, from the community as transgender, uh, a lesbian, a gay, the story is always bad and is a sort of, oh, somebody gets uh, punched by someone else or get bullied 
or they um, find themselves in a community that they just, okay, is horrible and blah, blah, blah. And we should together just stop all of that because um, like we are normal, like we, we are humans, first of all. So the same struggle that I can live as a gay person, someone else can live as a straight person. So the same struggle of, um, of feeling different or having issues with mental health can be lived by anyone else. And, um, and here is, is the fact of labels, you know, um, you watch the television, you read that book, you talk with that person and the person just talk through the labels. We just needed to help each other and support each other and hold on to each other to take out all that labels and all of that. I think that like I, I have this image of a world where we all dance together and we just all jump together. Um, if we, if each day we open the door of our house and we share a word of love to anyone else, that person we feel really good and gonna open the door and share word of love and more and more and more and more. We just should stop with labeling and we just should stop to um, keep using this hate in, in any kind of community, any kind of minority, any kind of vision of life. There is nothing good and nothing bad in life because what is bad for you can be good for me and vice versa. What is beautiful for you is probably is not for me. We should accept everything and be open to everything. And the first thing that we should do all together is to stop to create a horrible message, you know, and again, I connect with movies and all of that. Like, and it is also in, let, let's say in the straight world, it's not that you open your door and you're gonna find the man or the women of your life. And the same thing is not, is, is in the gay community, it doesn't happen like this. And you watch the movie and you really hope to open the door and find that person in that now because it's you not know, lo love is support. And if we don't support each other, and if we don't support the person that we're next to us, if we don't support the community, um, we're gonna keep doing the same mistake. And this is what we are doing. We are keep doing the same mistake right. all over and over again. So, yeah, absolutely. We are still to this day, not learning from past mistakes, past choices, past words, past labels. We are still continuing to utilize the past to hinder our growth to the future. So absolutely true. And, and Amy, I would love your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, Jude, that was a great answer. And I, first of all, to the, the person, the woman who wrote it, you know, thank you for the work you're doing as a childcare worker, like hats off to you. Like that's, that's tough work. I did it for a few years. I know what that's all about. I have two thoughts going through my head. So give me a minute. The first is about the families and the children is, you know, talking more. Yes, you have posters or you have the flags, we have books in your, your classrooms or your daycare rooms. And that's cool. Yet maybe there's some sort of a curriculum that can be created to teach, even at that little age of like the three-year-olds, of teaching them that, you know, with the right wording and the right everything about sexual orientation so that they can understand it. And, you know, you may feel that you have to write a letter to the, the parents and let them know of this. And if the, the parents don't want their child in there, then that's, that's their choice. They can do that. You can't turn away families for coming to your daycare um, who don't agree with the LGBT community, for example. However, the flip side to this is the employer. Because I read also that your co-workers of yours, you're noticing discrimination or hate speech or, or whatnot. I know daycares aren't always big, big companies. Some are, some are not. And I'm curious to know if like 
maybe they have a, a human resources person that they can go to and talk to. Are there policies in place about discrimination and having a safe space for all employees, regardless of their orientation or their religion or their cultural way of life to not be discriminated against? This comes into ideas I have for you about bringing in somebody to do a diversity sensitivity training, a workshop for your employees and have very, very clear boundaries. If you have an HR person of almost, almost like a three strikes you're out. Like if you're noticing doing this discrimination, this hate speech, and it's all been documented and you know in the appropriate manner and everything, and you have gone to your HR person and said, look, it's happened a number of times this date, this time, and going to your HR person and telling them, then the person, your coworker who's done it, then they need to have disciplinary action be done because mm -hmm. you need to feel safe. And that is part of your human right to feel safe at your workplace that you can be and work and as you are in your workplace. I, I'm sorry, I, that's, that's one of my like things I want to do more of is this education piece with employers and, and workplaces about you need, to, or I strongly suggest that they look at their diversity and their equality and their inclusion. I know those are three big buzzwords right now, yet they're needed because as this lovely woman shared, she's not feeling safe at her workplace and that needs to change. And it's, it's so true. And what a wonderful question to kind of end everything because I think we can all learn right now that education is the key. Education, education in all facets from young to old, to continuous is, is a key and labels. We need to remove labels because even the label of human rights, in some cases, people are determining who is allowed to have that title or label and who isn't. Everyone, humans helping humans, anybody who is a human is human rights. Any violation or aggression or anger or hate towards any human being is human rights. No matter what you think, what you believe in, what land that you walk on, what the color of your skin, everything, you are a human being. And I think we know now is education is needed more and more and more in the younger generation, the older generation as well, and removing of labels because we find now that labels are hindering our growth. So I could literally talk with you guys for the whole day, but I know Jude would have to go to bed eventually. And so would we would have to go to bed eventually. But I, I really truly wanna thank Simon for allowing us to have this safe place. I really wanna thank everybody as well that is having the courage and strength to ask questions because questions are really how things are, are doing. How we, how we get to get educated, how we learn, how we grow. The more we talk, the more we learn, the more we grow, the more connected we become. So if people wanna connect with you guys, Jude, I'll start with you. Where can we find you? Where can people reach you? So they can find me on Facebook, uh, my page Healing with Jude, uh, on Twitter, on um, Jude Healing, and, and also I do have a website that is uh, healingwithjude.com. Um, and if you are on Insight Timer, uh, you can find me as a teacher in there as Jude Gurini. Fantastic. And Amy, where can we uh, find you? Yeah, I also like Jude play in, in Facebook. So you can find my business page of Inch by Inch Empowerment. I also have a private safe community that is searchable, but you have to answer some questions to come into it. It's for adults who are either have a youth in their home or work with youth in their home, uh, work with youth in the community who are part of the LGBT community at that younger age, that 11 to 14. So that's Facebook. I also am on LinkedIn. If you just search Amy Hutton, as you see it spelt here on Zoom, I am active there. I am also on Instagram, Inch by Inch Empower, I think, or IBI Empowerment, one of the two. <laughs> it's me on Instagram. And, you know, would love to have conversations um, more with, with the folks who have uh, been here. So thank you. Absolutely. And again, the... the... The most amazing thing is, is we have this platform and 
if you want to, you know, talk more with Simud or get to know more about Simud, you know, you can contact Simud at www.simud, which is p s y m o d dot com, and you can find all the social media links. That you know, and also if you want to listen to our podcast, Amy and Jude were on the podcast. A very powerful podcast. Each and every one of you was fantastic, and that Simud series podcast on iTunes and Spotify. And don't forget um, as well, Simon is offering a free 15 minute intake session for users. So you get free 15 minutes and you just go to the website, you know, simood.com, which is P-S-Y-M-O-O-D.com. Jude and Amy's information is also in the contact page. So where you're located, asking the questions, it's all there for you guys as well. And we had a, a question pop up. It wasn't a question, but I think this is the most amazing way to end this webinar with each and every one of you. This is from Beverly, and I really want to thank her for this. This is this brings a lot of joy to me, and this is how powerful this conversation was and a wonderful way to end this. Thank you for sharing your insight and wisdom. I have learned much from my time here with you all tonight, wrapping you all up with a warm virtual hug from my heart to each of yours. Good night. Keep shining your bright light to bring about positive change. Simud is an online mental health platform that connects you with mental health specialists who speaks your language and understand your culture. You can find us at our website at simud.com and on our social media channels on Instagram, X, Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn at mysimud. Don't forget to follow, like, and share, and comment. Thank you for existing.